morning and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members uh, using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Uh, we have received apologies uh, from Jackson Carlaw. Uh, our first item of business today is the decision on taking agenda item three in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on Article 50 and UK Common Frameworks and I'd like to invite our panel of witnesses, Professor Michael Keating, Professor of Politics at the University of Aberdeen and Director of the Centre on Constitutional Change and Professor Stephen Tierney, Professor of Constitutional Theory at the University of Edinburgh and I'd like to invite Professor Keating to make an opening statement. Professor uh, well, thanks, Karina, and I bring apologies from Nicola McEwen who is not able to come today. I think you had uh, some notice of that. She's had a slight accident. Uh, <coughs> They, as, as you know, there's a lot of argument at the moment uh, about the withdrawal bill and uh, about what's going to happen to competences that are currently both devolved to Scotland and Europeanised. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about something upon which there is agreement amongst governments, that is that there should be frameworks of some sort to deal with those matters that are currently regulated at European level but will come back to the UK level after Brexit. There's been discussion around the Joint Ministerial Committees about this. There's been quite a lot of convergence between the two sides on what frameworks might look like, but there are still some big questions to be answered here. Uh, and we've got some big questions about how the both sides are going about frameworks, what frameworks are, what we mean by frameworks, and how they might be negotiated, what they might contain, uh, and how they might be implemented or enforced. Now, the notion of frameworks doesn't exist in the EU, sorry, the UK devolution settlement. It exists in many countries. A framework law is where you have a law setting down general principles and then the devolved or federated governments can fill in the details. These exist in Spain, in Italy, they used to exist in Germany, but they were abolished a few years ago, but in a kind of ghostly form, they still exist. And this is how the EU works. EU work policy making is about setting down general principles over most areas, leaving state and sub-state government the ability to fill in the details. Now, it's really important if we're introducing that principle into the UK, that we should realise this is a novelty, it implies a change in the devolution settlement, uh, and it's got to be thought through very carefully. What we have in the UK is a fairly clear division of competences between the devolved level and the UK level. There are some overlaps, but there is no hierarchy of laws. That is, there's no area in which you have both UK laws and devolved laws, and the UK law takes primacy. That is the principle of the framework law, and that is how the European Union works. Uh, there's also work to be done on how European frameworks might be brought into the British devolution settlement, if that is what we're going to do. EU, EU laws are proposed by the European Commission. They are adopted by uh, the Council of the European Union, used to be the Council of Ministers, uh, in various ways by qualified majority voting, sometimes by unanimity, but they're negotiated intergovernmentally and they require the consent of a sufficient number of member states. They're then directly applicable. They're subject to the principle of subsidiarity and proportionality, that is, things should be done at the lowest level possible uh, and only proportionally, that is, Europe should act only insofar as it's necessary not intruding where it's not necessary on national or sub-state competences. Now, there's been no discussion of that in the argument about frameworks here. Uh, and then the framework laws of the European Union are enforceable by the Court of Justice of the European Union. They do take uh, a legal form. We're told that some of these new frameworks will be legislative, some of them will be concordats, some of them will be memorandum of understanding, we don't really know how these uh, are going to work, except the UK government so far has suggested that certain things should be subject to 
uh, legislative frameworks and other things should be subjected to more informal uh, arrangements. Now, as to the form of frameworks, in our paper we say there are two ways you could go about doing this. One is what happens in the EU single market, and the term single market or internal market has also been introduced into the United Kingdom coming from Europe. Uh, but in the case of the EU single market, what are laid down are not detailed provisions normally, but general principles about market competition, for example. Competition is the most important one. Free movement and so on. And from that are derived specific rulings of the European Commission and decisions of the Council of Ministers. But very often it's the European Commission that will take up these ideas, apply them, uh, and then, if necessary, they, they go to the European Court of Justice. And this means that issues come up in all sorts of unexpected ways. Uh, and my favourite example of that is from here, it's minimum pricing of alcohol, which has just come in after about five years, where it was tangled up in the European courts and the domestic courts. That was a public health issue, but somebody said it's a single market issue, uh, and so it became a single market issue. The other way is to list individual competences, start from the bottom up and, and try and go through the statute book and work out which pieces of legislation may overlap between UK devolved and European levels. Uh, and that is the way that the governments have gone about this process. They gone into for these deep dives, they've come up with long lists of competences. And the risk there is that the list might be too broad or it might be too narrow. There are things that might be unanticipated that might come up because of single market considerations or because of uh, foreign trade uh, agreements. So we're a bit critical about the way they've gone about this. Instead of saying, what do we mean by the internal market? What might foreign uh, agreements, international agreements uh, apply, and then working from there, they started at the other end and looked at individual uh, competences, which is just not the way that the European Union works, and it's not the way uh, in which you might think of a single market as, as operating. And then finally, there's the question of how these frameworks are negotiated, whether it is necessary to reserve competences, even temporarily to do this, or whether it can be done while leaving the competences where they are. That is the current argument between the UK government and uh, the Scottish government. <clears throat> but insofar as they're negotiable, they're being negotiated, and there does seem to be a willingness on both sides here to try and get things done by uh, agreement, then how will that be done? Will there be a horizontal negotiation, that is, something like the wealth government has suggested, a UK Council of Ministers to replace the European Council of Ministers, in which they have the status of equality, including somebody speaking from England, for England? Uh, or will it be a more hierarchical process in which the UK government uh, introduces frameworks, in which the UK government speaks for both uh, England and the United Kingdom? That's an important. Whether that takes a legal form is, is really a secondary question uh, that we can think about in due course. The main thing is, is to establish that there would be a negotiation amongst equals rather than a top-down process. Then, finally, in the paper, we look at three policy areas just as illustrations of, of this dynamic and these, these problems. That's the basic principle. Stephen can talk about some of the legal aspects of this, and, and we can talk about some of the policy areas later on if that's what you want to discuss. Uh, thank you very much for that, and uh, thank you for your paper, which uh, I've certainly read very closely and found very interesting. Um, can I ask, in one aspect of your paper, you mention that the Scottish and Welsh governments have argued that they make policy within EU frameworks rather than just implementing them. Um, I wonder, could you give us more details and perhaps even examples of how you can make policy within the EU frameworks that differs uh, and, uh, fr from other countries and how they implement the frameworks? <coughs> yes. Uh, generally speaking, in the UK, the flexibility that's allowed to member states is handed down to the devolved level in respect of their own competences. The only other place where this really works in that way is, is, is Belgium, so it's really quite, quite exceptional. Uh, because in Spain, they, they, they have this hierarchy of laws uh, as, as well. So if it's a Scottish responsibility, Scotland will have that 
that responsibility for making the policy. I've got some examples in agriculture where Scotland has made decisions that are quite different from those of England, uh, and Wales and Northern Ireland are quite different again. In fact, within agricultural policy, there's as much variation within the United Kingdom as there is amongst the EU 28 uh, member states. For example, the, uh, what used to be called modulation, that is moving from direct support to farmers into rural policy. Quite a bit of difference there. Uh, uh, direct payments. The <coughs> uh, Scottish farmers have some production-linked uh, payments. Uh, and the uh, various tests, the tests for an active farmer, it is implied more stringently in Scotland. There's a cap on the amount of support that can be received by any farmer in Scotland. Uh, the, the DEFRA minister, Michael Gove, when he was DEFRA minister, uh, said that uh, after Brexit, we'll be able to cap the direct payments to farmers. We can already do that, and Scotland does that, Wales does that, and Northern Ireland does that. So these are quite important variations. Similarly, it's, it's possible, because of the devolution settlement, to mix and match the various instruments in detail to develop a rural policy for Scotland that is distinctly Scottish. Whereas if the, uh, if the frameworks were too constraining, and particularly if the frameworks were about individual bits and pieces of policy, then Scotland might not be able to assemble all those policy instruments it needs to have a genuine agriculture and rural policy because it didn't necessarily know where all the competences lie. Right, thanks very much. Uh, I was struck by, um, you, you mentioned it in your opening statement where you said that there is a danger that by proceeding according to the list that the UK government seemed to prefer, that the coverage of issues is both too wide and, uh, and also too narrow and not providing for unanticipated implications of UK um, or international trade agreements. Are you able to elaborate on that? Uh, yes. We don't know what international trade agreements are going to contain. These days, international trade agreements are much more are about much more than trade in the narrow old sense. Uh, they very often have provisions about levels of, of permittable support, state aids, environmental standards, labour standards, all kinds of things to make sure that trading conditions are genuinely fair and appropriate. Uh, and when we get into agricultural trade, because very few trade agreements do include agriculture, but the UK government says it wants agriculture in a trade deal with the EU and with third countries, then there's an awful lot of regulatory alignment involved, a lot of lot to make sure that uh, support systems, subsidy systems and regulations are aligned so that goods can flow uh, freely. But we don't really know what those are going to be because we don't know what the trade agreements are going to be or, or what kind of things that might be put into those. Uh, and so if we simply say frameworks are related to an existing bundle of competences that are shared by the EU and the UK and the devolved governments, that might not be the right list for future trade agreements that might have other kinds of things uh, within them. Uh, at the moment, there is a provision for UK ministers to instruct Scottish ministers to give effect to international obligations, which might cover that. But again, it would mean that the UK government was giving instructions to devolved governments. It was to use that clause, which is not used so far. Uh, or ultimately, the UK government has the, not, still notwithstanding, has the right to overrule the devolves and, and simply pass its own legislation. But again, that's, that's not consistent with the spirit of devolution as, as we've known it. Was it a supplementary, Richard? Uh, yes, in relation to Michael Keating's first response. Thank you, Kandira. Um, can I pick you up on your example of agricultural policy? And my experience as nine years as Cabinet Secretary attending European negotiations is that Scotland was often rescued by the European Union, where there have been policy diversions between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. But because the decisions were taken in Brussels, often the UK did not get their way, and therefore we were able to do our policy divergence. Issues like the privatisation of fish quota and over different agricultural regimes as well. So my question is, <clears throat> how do we have a situation where devolution and the current proposals in the UK government are compatible uh, with the 
motivation of the frameworks, which is uh, maintaining an internal UK market. Mm -hmm. Because I am extremely concerned and worried that the UK government will put the kibosh on all Scottish decision making over issues where they have a different view by saying it interferes with the UK single market. Well, we, we, we don't have a mechanism for resolving that kind of problem there, uh, uh, which is one of the points we're making in the paper. Within the EU, there are mechanisms for resolving those kinds of things. We have a very weak system of intergovernmental policy making within the UK, in which the UK level has the last word. And, and we're suggesting that may be unsatisfactory because it doesn't correspond to the way that the EU works for the reasons you, you, you just mentioned. There's also a, a difference in understandings of frameworks between those, uh, and this is more or less the position of the Welsh Government, who are quite happy with the idea of joint policy making, UK-wide policies, as long as they're negotiated. Uh, whereas the Scottish Government has tended to put more emphasis on their scope for making policies differently. There's, there's, I, I don't want to exaggerate that difference, but there is a difference uh, of emphasis there. But insofar as we go down the road of joint policy making, then it would be very important that that is genuinely joint policy making and not simply the UK government laying down uh, the line. Uh, there needs to be something put in place there to make sure that these frameworks, in other words, are uh, done by consent with the devolved levels and not simply imposed. Very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. A, a question following on from that um, might be, are there examples where, within the UK, as it's currently arranged, we have made shared um, policy with the UK government? Does that make... So the relationship that Scotland has with the EU laws and the flexibility we have, is there an example of something that operates just within the UK where we've reached agreement? that would maybe be a future yes, model. Yes, yes. Well, well, I mean, one of the, the, the big issues is that the, the structure of the Act, the structure of the Scotland Act, caters really for parallel development of policy. So matters are either reserved or devolved. There's not an awful lot in terms of shared policy, uh, shared competences. Um, and the way the, the law operates really is, is when it comes to these agreements, a, a big dis distinction between the negotiation and implementation. And typically, the whole negotiation area has been dealt with through the umbrella of the EU. So if you take justice and home affairs, for example, um, there's actually been quite a lot of um, shared policy approach between the UK and Scottish levels, which has generally been to opt out of the big Schengen arrangements, but to opt in selectively on particular issues uh, in terms of police cooperation and um, criminal enforcement cooperation. So I think that, that is one area where it comes to the negotiation level, and that's operated under the umbrella of the EU. So the is one issue will be, will that continue? Will the frameworks facilitate that kind of cooperation? The, the second issue really is the implementation issue, and that seems to be something of a sticking point because, as Michael alluded to, the Scotland Act does provide for a power for the UK government to enforce implementation if there's a sense that um, the devolved administrations are not complying with international agreements and that's that hasn't been used and it's 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 clearly not something that um would be political would, would well it's something that would be deeply politically problematic so that's something that the frameworks will have to account for too um dispute resolution and how these things will be agreed but there are areas that are more consensual justice and home affairs is one but clearly there are areas that michael's touched on that could be deeply contentious yeah, I was going to ask about um, dispute resolution and you gave the example of Wales who have suggested a kind of council of ministers of equal standing of government. So where England fits in there is, is a question that hadn't really been answered. Has there been any other, has there been proposals from the Scottish government or the UK government or is anybody else putting forward suggestions about how this might look, how the intergovernment relations will look after um, we leave the EU? I mean, Michael can answer this too, but I think this is this frameworks issue is part of a bigger debate about intergovernmental relations after Brexit, and, and largely we're focusing upon re the renegotiation of, of arrangements with EU partners or third party states. But there is a much bigger issue here about intergovernmental relations, and many recommendations have been put forward over the years for a more formalisation. Uh, for more formalisation or at least for, for a clearer structure, for more transparency and so on. Um, and th there's not really been much progress on that, I think largely because everyone's now so focused upon the, the granular issues of Brexit. Um, but clearly this has to be built into the debate. 
And do you think, sorry, so that... uh, one final question. When you describe the different models um, that other European countries operate under, which do you use the term umbrella, that's the term I was thinking of that made it in simple language for me to understand that you have a primary government and underneath that sit regional governments and they can make their own policies within it. Um, that's not a model that sits with our devolution settlement. The other option would be, uh, I suppose, th which we're operating on at the moment, where you divide the competencies and you have equal partners. Are there other European countries that work on, on that model? Would we be unique in going forward with that? And but do you th think we could ever... Uh, because it seems that the, the umbrella model is acceptable within other European countries. It doesn't appear that would be a solution that would satisfy within the UK. Well, well the... the, the, the Framework laws ex exist in Spain and in Italy, where the central government sets out a broad parameters within which the devolved governments can make policy. For example, they're allowed to make something like 40% of the educational curriculum, and the state government 60%. I can't remember the exact figure. That has become extremely contentious. It really is very, very difficult to work. There's endless litigation in the constitutional courts of Italy and Spain uh, out of that. So it's not an example that anybody in Spain or Italy would recommend for exporting to us. The German model has traditionally been not to divide competences between the two levels, but to have the federal level setting out the broad frameworks uh, and the, uh, the lender effectively implementing policy. The lender haven't done an awful lot of legislation. Uh, that has been changing a little bit because, again, that was seen as being uh, too complicated. Uh, in, 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 in the devolution settlement we have, it tends to be the other model, that is, there's a fairly clear distinction of the competences of the two levels. It's not completely clear. There, there are overlaps, of course. There, there, there always uh, are. But if we're going to move away from that, and inevitably we are going to be moving a little bit away from that because uh, of this question about UK single market, UK internal market, replacing the European market, and because many things that are currently subject to EU law will now become subject to international treaties. They move into that category. A lot of things to do with the agricultural regulation, environmental law, and so on. Then we really need to think about the implications of that and, and which of those models we're going to go for. Now, we're not making any recommendations, but, but we should at least be thinking about where we're heading. But as Stephen says, this has been overwhelmed by the urgency of Brexit and the dangers we may just stumble into uh, a solution which does change our constitutional understandings without having given it proper thought. And at least, because now we've got the transition period, we've got the UK government's promise that the re-reservation of competences will be subject to a sunset clause, two plus five years, so effectively up to seven years, that at least might give us time to think about these things. And if the competences are going to be reserved temporarily before they come back again, it would be important to think more carefully about exactly how that fits into our devolution settlements. Taking into account the lessons from Spain, Italy and Germany, where they've had to change things because they found that th their own system has not worked terribly well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> the issue of uh, intergovernmental relations uh, has been uh, raised uh, on numerous occasions uh, in this Parliament, uh, particularly in the, the last uh, session of Parliament. Uh, I mean, you look at the, at the situation regarding the GMC process uh, and how, uh, and how in, unequal that process actually is. It's never met outside of London um, in terms of when ministers and cabinet secretaries attend. It's usually uh, very heavily weighted <coughs> by UK government ministers. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, in terms of notifications, I mean, um, uh, the, the letters are sent uh, regularly. Uh, we'll get the letters here that, uh, from uh, from Michael Russell, uh, indicating that uh, no agenda has been provided. So, in terms of uh, going forward with some type of process, um, surely there has to be a fundamental element of respect uh, in any type of framework that is going to be uh, devised. Uh, in, uh, and you said yourself a moment ago, Professor Keating, that uh, the potential is that we could just stumble upon some type of solution in the future. Um, and I think that would be extremely uh, worrying and concerning uh, for uh, many people in the country. 
Yeah. Michael will talk about the framework of IGR in general, but there is one legal point that I would like to come back to, which kind of frames the debate to some extent, which is that the competences of the Scottish Parliament and of the other devolved arrangements are not actually being removed here. And that actually gives the devolved administrations quite a lot of, of weight. Um, when it comes to the implementation of policy, because those competences are still firmly in, in embedded in the devolution acts, there is scope for the, the devolved legislatures to implement policy and to continue to implement po policy in, in differential ways, provided it falls in devolved areas. So it's very much in the interests of the UK government to arrive at processes of IGR that are agreeable to the devolved administrations. We often think of devolved administrations here as quite powerless and frustrated by the way things are working. But in fact, in this new environment, when so many powers are now coming back in areas that de facto are going to have to be shared in the subject of frameworks, um, the, the capacity of the devolved parliaments to, to make law in those areas um, is, is quite significant. And I think it would, is fundamentally in the interests of the UK government to start to take more seriously uh, a process towards some form of formalisation, transparency, um, firmer commitment to agreement in the IGR process than, than currently prevails. And I think there's quite a lot of weight that devolved parliaments have to make clear that, that this is now a firm expectation. Hmm. Professor Keating? Yes, I think, I think that's, that's right. And, and I think the, the, the problem with intergovernmental relations here has not been so much about notions of respect or trust, because these are abstract ideas that have got to be built from, from somewhere, I think. There's a lack of institutional underpinning. There's a lack of uh, clarification about what happens in the last resort. The last resort is always that the UK can get, can govern, can get its way. Uh, and if we know that, that is the case, then uh, that changes the whole dynamic of negotiations. Uh, that that the, the UK government can uh, go in there knowing that there'll be a political cost to pay. It may cause a political row but ultimately it can get its own, own way. And I don't know of any other system of intergovernmental relations in the world where that is so comprehensively true. Uh, in a federal system, the federated units would have their own competences that belong to them that simply cannot be overridden. So that the federal government, if it wants to negotiate, has to get uh, the agreement. Now, in such systems, that provides an incentive to cooperation. It doesn't necessarily produce deadlock. Knowing that you've got to have an agreement, then you work very hard at, at, at getting that agreement. And that goes throughout the entire system. Uh, another problem uh, has been not so much that the UK government wants to engage in, in a power grab of devolved competences, because I really don't think it's, it's interested in that. It's that the UK government just tends to neglect the devolved level, uh, partly because it's, it's, it's legislating for England and the UK at the same time, uh, and partly because in the departments in Whitehall, uh, they sometimes uh, lost their connections with it all. They don't understand the issues. They constantly have to be uh, reminded. So those are two critical factors. And once again, they're connected because it was necessary always to get the consent for the devolves over things that may overlap between the two levels. The UK level would have to put more investment into thinking about what's happening in the devolved territories, uh, what their distinct concerns are and anticipate those kinds of conflicts so that, so that they wouldn't occur. I'm not in favour of proliferating intergovernmental committees all over the place. That's, that's, that's not the answer. The answer is to identify clearly where the competencies lie and then have a procedure whereby if there's a deadlock, you can get an agreement. Just on that then, in terms of uh, procedure, um, in terms of the, the environmental um, aspect and the environmental frameworks, it's, uh, it's been suggested that uh, the majority of frameworks uh, in, in this policy area are likely to be non-legislative. Um, what are your thoughts about that? But also, um, how do you think the, um, there is any level of uh, parliamentary scrutiny uh, and the role of, the, uh, of parliaments if they're to be non-legislative? <coughs> One of the, my other roles is I serve as legal advisor to the Constitution Committee in the Lords, and the, the, there was a, a report issued, a detailed report on IGR that I think would merit close attention again, which I think put forward a lot of detailed practical recommendations for how things could be improved. And one of the big areas that the, that report looked at is, is parliamentary scrutiny. And it's clear that that's a very underworked 
area, and this is going to be very, very important. I think the issue in the new frameworks, one of the huge issues is going to be parliamentary scrutiny, scrutiny both at the, the process of negotiation, particularly where that negotiation might involve other countries, because at the moment um, the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament have a role because of established mechanisms for European treaty scrutiny. That will no longer apply. So I think this Parliament's going to have to think very carefully about how it builds in scrutiny of negotiations with regard to frameworks, particularly when they involve other states. Um, but also there's going to be a, a, a very important role for Parliament to, to scrutinise the, the actual implementation. And a, a question will be not simply parliamentary scrutiny of the intergovernmental dis discussions, but whether the Parliament has the resources really to, to properly scrutinise so many of these new agreements, particularly when they might actually result in secondary legislation. Um, so, yeah, I think Parliament really needs to think about how it's going to resource that and what committees it might need and whether some dedicated um, committee to, to look specifically at these frameworks will be, will be appropriate. Well, just, I mean, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, uh, I mean, these are discussions that we are having uh, in that committee regarding the secondary legislation that you're, you're aware of, uh, but, but, and also with the anticipation of over 300 uh, pieces of secondary legislation, notwithstanding any future primary legislation needs to come. But in terms of the frameworks, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a different beast. As you say, because this is probably a non-legislative issue, um, and I think that's why, when it comes to framing new IGR arrangements, transparency is going to be absolutely a, a crucial element um, in terms of the agenda setting and how much uh, information is released, because Parliament can only scrutinise what it knows about. Professor Keating. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree with what, what Stephen has said. I think it's, it's, it's vitally important, and that's an issue that has been around a long time, but the more of these frameworks we got, the, the more acute that issue is going to become. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Marie Goujon. Thank you very much. Before I ask my substantive questions, I really just wanted a, a, to ask a supplementary um, to Stuart McMillan's previous question that uh, Michael Keating, you responded to. And it was really just about that, um, I suppose, what seems like a lack of understanding in the Whitehall departments that you mentioned about devolution and how that operates. I suppose I feel like almost at the moment we're perhaps in a, a catch-22 with that because... If there isn't that understanding there at the moment, I don't see what is going to fundamentally change or make that, or how we then make those government departments understand and actually take cognizance of the issues here, especially if, like you say, there's always that fallback position that they can essentially do what they like anyway, uh, unlike the situations in other countries. So it's really just, how do you think we can possibly hope to change that situation and change that understanding so that we can actually have a meaningful progress in these areas? Well, in, in, in 1976, uh, uh, until 1979, I taught a course for Whitehall civil servants in devolution because we thought it was going to happen. It was that important that all the incoming high flyers had to go through it. Uh, that didn't happen in the 1990s, 20 years later. Uh, and that's, that's just Im important. That's got to be embedded in the, in the training of civil servants, that sensitivity. Uh, there's also the question of turnover in, 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 in Whitehall. There's a high turnover of, of officials, and officials then establish relationships with the devolves. They, they, they get to know people. Relationships tend to be uh, good at, at, at the ground level, but then somebody else moves in. That needs to be built in more clearly into the... In, in, into the system. Uh, similarly, at, at a ministerial level, uh, ministers similarly in Whitehall are very often uh, in, insensitive to, in the sense that they're unaware of the devolved implications of these things. They've got to learn more about that. It's difficult, of course, because we've got such an asymmetrical system here. We've got 85% of the population, 85% of the MPs from, from England. That, that is, I think, beginning to change, and it's beginning to change partly because of what's happening in, within England itself. You've got city mayors now, you, you've got the question of London, you've got territorial politicians of, of some weight, and the, these things really do matter. Uh, but uh, I, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do about that institutionally. It takes a, a change of, of mentality, a change of, of understanding. And e every time one of these crises arises over the withdrawal bill or something like that, that again sensitises people in London to, to the importance of this issue. Uh, 
Um, but as I say, it's, it's always going to be difficult, and it's something that's got to be uh, worked on. There's a, a couple of possible practical um, suggestions. On, one is to focus on the civil servants themselves, and there have been suggestions about improving training. I think the UK government has at least notionally begun processes of better devolution training for, for civil servants. Another option is, of course, greater transfer between the different administrations, but then that hits hurdles, practical hurdles like housing costs in London and so on. I think another way to do it is to impose obligations on government, because if you impose obligations on government, that focuses civil servants. So, for example, if there are to be new concordats that are prepared in relation to these frameworks, one, um, it, one suggestion would be to require their frequent renewal um, and, and re revision because this is going to be such a fluid area. So, for example, any new concordats ought to be reviewed on an annual basis. That would require civil servants to keep on top of, of what's happening, the, how well the concordats are working. Another um, thing that could be built into new agreements would be an obligation on the part of the Prime Minister, possibly First Ministers, to report to Parliament formally in every session as or, or after each um, GMC meeting in relation to these frameworks with a full account of what has taken place, what progress was made from the previous one. Um, not only would that be good for Parliament itself to hear directly from government in that respect, it would fo force civil servants to be on top of these issues. So those are some of the things that I think people should be thinking about as, as, we, as we move to try and, and formalise some of the, the framework mm -hmm. scrutiny. Can I just add one thing to that too, which is inter-parliamentary cooperation too. And there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, that, that the devolved in the Westminster Parliament should be able to uh, interrelate to each other. And there'll be all sorts of suggestions about joint investigations. And, and I was with the Public Administration Committee on, on, on Monday in the city chambers, and they said, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could meet in the Scottish Parliament? And everybody said, yes, yeah, everybody, everybody said. Uh, yeah. and, and it surprised people that that, wasn't, that didn't happen uh, more often. So that, that would also improve the scrutiny function uh, as well and, and sensitise Westminster uh, MPs to, to what's going on at the devolved level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think I just, remain, ugh, I suppose, remain concerned that, I mean, some of the bigger things that you talk about there, about the, uh, a, a change of mentality is needed. I mean, obviously that is going to take, I feel like that's not a quick thing to do and that is something that obviously would take quite a long time to embed. I, but just to move on to some other questions, it was really just around the funding elements and I thought that that was a really interesting element in your paper, particularly in relation to agriculture, where you talked about how only 17% of the land in England is in areas of natural constraint, which was formerly less favoured, compared with 70% in Northern Ireland, 81% in Wales and 85% in Scotland. And also, when you say it's estimated that between 50 and 60% of farm income in the UK is a whole comes from cap payments in Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. It is 87, 80, and 75 percent, uh, respectively. Um, so it's really just in terms of if you could further elaborate that exactly how important that is to Scotland and how you see these funding arrangements working uh, post Brexit and uh, in relation to the the Barnet formula as well. If it went along according to the Barnet formula, how would we see that impact in Scotland? And uh, I mean, I I, don't, I haven't seen any further details. Far as I'm aware, about the UK-wide shared prosperity fund as well. I don't know if you have maybe any, if there has been any further detail published on that that you know about uh, that would be worth us hearing about here as well. Yeah, we, we we don't know very much about what's going to happen here. The UK government has in, uh, issued a, a paper, a discussion paper on agriculture for England, which proposes that direct payments for farmers will be phased out altogether. Now, that would have huge implications if that were applied in Scotland because of the figures you just cited. It would be much more serious in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland than it would uh, in England. We don't know whether, under a framework, Scotland would be permitted to keep those direct payments or not. That would be a very contentious issue. It might be argued, well, that would be unfair to farmers in England if Scottish farmers got those direct payments, or it might be Say, you might say, well, it doesn't really matter. It's not, it's not that important. We just, we just don't know. Uh, and the DEFRA white paper very carefully avoids making UK-wide commitments because that's for another stage. But we know where they're heading. And it wasn't very surprising that that white paper said we were heading uh, in that direction. So there are implications then for funding regimes uh, around the UK, different parts of, of the UK. As for how these are going to be funded, uh, at present... Uh, the, the, these payments are funded 
the direct payments for farmers are funded from the European Union, and the rural development payments are jointly funded for, by, 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 the, by the Scottish Government in this case and by uh, the European Union. Uh, following Brexit, that money comes back to the UK, we're a net contributor, this money comes back again. How would that then be distributed? Now, one possibility is that this could be incorporated in the framework. So if you have an agricultural framework, there would be a funding mechanism uh, to, to match that. So the framework would be enforced almost by funding. I suspect that's not going to happen. Uh, I, I don't think DEFRA would be interested in, in, in doing that. Uh, another would be to say, well, what they do at the moment, de facto, which was give Scotland, was, was, well, give each of the nations the share they got last time around. That's what they did last time with the agricultural funding. They, they squared it with European regulations. And then you can do what you, you like with it. A slightly different version of that is to barnetize it. Now, that would mean that it would go into the block funding, not the agricultural fund, the block fund, so that rural policy would have to compete with education, health, and all the other things, uh, which farmers would not be happy about because it might be difficult to maintain their share in, in that kind of competition. Uh, but it would also mean that their share under Barnet, their base share, is pretty much guaranteed because it's only the margin. Uh, every time there's a funding round, the margin shifts according to population. So you keep your base funding. That would be a pretty good deal for Scotland and Wales. People, very many people don't think that. They think that Barnet means you'd only get 8.5%. It doesn't. It means you keep the existing funding. Uh, but as agricultural spending fell in England, and it will do, then Scotland would, Scottish spending would also uh, fall. But, but that's, that's probably the best deal that, that, that Scotland could get, because at least there wouldn't be uh, drastic changes. Uh, and as for the Prosperity Fund, we know very little about that, but it may be that that would be operated on the same basis as the existing cohesion funds from the European Union. That is, they are selectively distributed according to a formula that has some need indicators within it, a little bit of political fiddling around with that, uh, and then matching funding uh, along with that. So the UK would say, well, you can get so much if you follow these guidelines and, and if you match funding. That, of course, would be something of a centralising measure, uh, as the cohesion funds are, because Scotland would then have to uh, follow those guidelines and, and put its own money where that was uh, as well. It's a little bit like the city deals, which were rolled out to the devolved nations just a couple of years ago. Uh, and it requires uh, the Scottish government and local governments and other bodies to put in match funding. That might be considered to be distorting of our own priorities here, because it's the UK government says you'll get more money if you put your own money that way. It's also incredibly complicated, as the cohesion programs are really complicated. Uh, and you might ask, is that not a very cumbersome and complicated and expensive way to spend rather small uh, um, amounts of money? So if we do think that, the alternative, well, just put those into the Barnett formula as well. That, that would be another way of doing it. But the idea of the UK Prosperity Fund is the former model. Uh, and the UK government might want to do this because it likes to uh, be seen to be spending money in the devolved territories and, and to be getting credit for it. That's a lot of what city deals are about, the UK government raising its profile here. So there might be political incentives uh, to do that. But, but the more of these initiatives you get, the more complicated it becomes and, and, and the more the administrative costs are in, increase. So it, it may just be simpler to say, well, put all that into the block grant and let the devolved governments go about it the way they like. But it seems that uh, with the prosperity fund, at least that's not going to happen. Running out of time, so I'm going to have to move on. Um, uh, Ross Greer. Thanks, convener. The nature that the, the frameworks will take has been mentioned a, a number of times now, and Michael, you mentioned in your opening remarks that some will obviously take a, a legislative uh, format and, and some will not. I'm still somewhat unclear as to the, the rationale the UK government has taken in deciding uh, what requires a legislative framework and, and what does not. What's your understanding of, of their rationale, how they've, how they've categorised here? It's, it's, it's not entirely clear to me either, and I don't think it's anything's settled on that. I think that will be something that's have, going to have to be worked through. And a real practical issue is parliamentary time. Um, the, the issue is 
what we're, lo what we're looking at at the moment, and certainly at Westminster, is a huge backlog in legislation, and I actually, and I think a lot of um, a lot of bills are going to have to go through. Bills we haven't yet envisaged are going to have to be brought forward in terms of the withdrawal and implementation agreement, things that have not been foreseen. So I think a lot of it's really going to come down to practical matters of parliamentary time. Um, and I think my expectation is a lot of this would be done by secondary legislation, a lot, possibly a lot more than is presently envisaged. Um, and to turn to the, the issue of consent, which has been the political highlight of, of this saga and, and where there's been the, the most significant area of, of clash, I'm wondering, is there precedent elsewhere in Europe? As has been highlighted, that there's clear precedent elsewhere uh, of different levels of government being able to, to essentially overrule each other, depending on the, the constitutional framework of uh, different nations. Is there a precedent for the kind of language that's included in, that's now proposed for the UK withdrawal bill, in terms of a, uh, the outright rejection of consent being considered as a consent decision? Um, I understand entirely that there's precedent elsewhere of being able to, different levels of government or parliament being able to overrule each other. Is there precedent for that kind of language being embedded into the legislation? Well, well the, the, the Seoul Convention has worked so far uh, pretty well because it's not been invoked very often uh, and there's a degree of ambiguity about it, what would happen if legislative consent were not given. That's a way of squaring the circle of parliamentary supremacy with recognising devolution. It was the best they could do at the time. Uh, it was bedding down uh, and then it was put into legislation in the Scotland Act of 2016 and the Wales Act of 2017 and maybe Stephen can comment on this legal aspect. It seemed to me odd to write into legislation a convention and then say it's not legislative anymore. Okay. I mean, effectively, it's, 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 it's a strange way of, 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 of using law. Either something's legal or, or, or it's not legal. But you can understand the political logic of it. The UK government and parliament making a statement before that had time to bed in, we got Brexit, which I think put more weight on that convention than it was ever intended to bear, uh, and, and, and before it had really bedded in. Now, with this latest amendment to the withdrawal bill, uh, the UK government has is retreated a long way. It's accepted the principle of legislative consent, even for statutory instruments, uh, so, so it has not violated the existing understanding. It's just exposed a weakness in the existing understanding that was already there. And then the clause that you're referring to, where it says A, B, and C all amount to consent, was just drawing attention to it in what was probably a very unhelpful way. Uh, in, in the, all that ambiguity has disappeared because they've said for the first time, they've said explicitly, uh, no legislative consent will allow it to, uh, to go ahead. So from a political point of view, I, I, I thought it was... Uh, clarifying, laying down things that, that previously had been political understandings and had worked as political understandings. Maybe you've got some comment on the legal aspect. It, yes, it is a curious thing. I mean, it brings up the whole idea of what a convention is. Um, and essentially, we have law on the one hand, which is binding, and political practice, which is nothing more than political practice. And a convention exists in the middle, in this sort of grey area. What we have discovered in the Miller case with regard to triggering Article 50 was the Supreme Court said well, I, the Seoul Convention is simply a, a political principle. Um, well, I, I don't think that's correct. It's, it's a bit more than that. It's, it is a practice which is repeatedly observed, and it's observed because people consider it to be binding. I think what we would have to begin to ask ourselves in light of this proposal, and where, uh, after the, if the withdrawal bill goes through without consent, if we then find regulations repeatedly being made, I mean, re regulations don't technically come under the Seoul Convention, but given a general commitment to consent, if they're repeatedly made without consent, I think what we'd have to ask really is whether there is still a Seoul Convention, because a convention is something which is considered to be binding and which is repeatedly observed. If we find that it's no longer considered to be binding and is not repeatedly observed, I think the issue really is, can we still talk about a Seoul Convention? Thank you. Thanks. Um, can I come back in on the issue of um, in the environment in your paper, um, where you talk about, um, uh, in particular, you're talking about there are relatively few environmental areas um, which are considered to require legislative frameworks, but these included waste packaging and product regulations and the implementation of the EU emissions trading scheme. And it's not yet clear whether the UK intends to leave the ETS or, would, uh, or what would replace it. And to go back to the waste packaging and product regulations, I mean, just to kind of get this 
down to practical things that actually people actually care about and affect them. Um, one thing that Scotland did was bring in the plastic bag charge a year ahead, uh, well, several years ahead, I believe, of the rest of the UK, and we're currently looking at issues to around bottle deposit schemes. Is that the kind of thing, if we decided to go in a different direction in those areas, could is that the kind of area where we could be constrained from doing what we did in the past because of frameworks? It would depend on, the, on how detailed the framework was, but it would only be the framework that would be binding in a sense. I mean, or in other words, the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament would only feel themselves constrained if they accepted the terms of an informal framework. Uh, the competence of the Parliament remains. Uh, and this is a point you know, I, I tried to make earlier, that in fact these devolved powers are still there. And until the Scotland Act has changed, it's still within the, the, the competence of the Scottish Parliament to continue to legislate in areas that are devolved areas. Professor Keating. Uh, yes, you, you put down a, a, a piece which is Nicholas part of the paper, so we probably can't get into the details of that particular one. Stephen has exposed the question of, of, of what not legislative frameworks really mean, how binding they are. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought in a practical sense that that particular example would, would, would be a problem. It doesn't occur to me that sort of thing. The frameworks would go into that uh, level of, of detail. Uh, but insofar as they did, then once again, we're, we're back to the question of what is a framework? How is it enforceable? Okay, thanks very much. You, one thing is when, when you made your opening remarks, you mentioned that um, Germany, the federal system in Germany, had had frameworks and that they had stopped using them. I think your phrase was that they had, they had basically went into abeyance. Could you say more about why that happened? Yes. The, 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 there was a reform of the federal uh, system which was trying to disentangle competences to uh, some degree so as to get greater transparency and accountability into the system to get rid of this very complicated and time-consuming and expensive way of joint policy making and to, to decentralise more power down to the lender level. Now, that's always very difficult in Germany because you do it and then things go back to the, this, this intergovernmental complicated system. That was the logic of it. The reform didn't result in any dramatic changes in, in, in the constitution, but they did get rid of the, um, the joint task frameworks and, and, and the, uh, most of the framework laws. I'm just trying to recall the detail of this. Uh, but in practice, there's a lot of joint policy making still going on. So uh, in education policy, for example, uh, instead of having this jointly made federal education policy with the lender participating and the Bundesrat, which is the second chamber of parliament representing the lender being involved, they got rid of that. But then the lender ministers just got together and amongst themselves engaged in a lot of horizontal cooperation. So there's still joint policy making, but without the federal government involved, less hierarchical, more horizontal than, uh, than vertical. So they moved from one model to another. And I think we could learn from that because that model whereby the lender can get together and cooperate is, is an interesting one. And it might be a way of dealing with frameworks without the element of hierarchy that people are a little bit suspicious about in, in this case. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence today. Um, oh, I have a, sorry, I thought we were finished. Uh, Rachel, uh, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I just wondered how much flexibility um, there's going to have to be um, with, I suppose, policy making to um, meet some of the requirements or the, or the expectations of, for example, the um, Food and Drink Federation, the um, Scottish National Farmers, the National Farmers Union of Scotland, uh, where they want regulatory. Um, consistency within the common framework, such as food labelling or um, animal welfare and traceability pesticides regulation. Um, do, you, do you think that we'll be in a position where the governments put those um, needs first or they stick to their guns and um, keep their own, I suppose, unique um, policies within the devolved administrations? Well, well, well I, I've talked to a lot of people around the area of, of agriculture and I find a general agreement amongst governments, the farmers, everybody, that they don't want regulatory divergence within the United Kingdom, nor do they want international 
rate di divergence to a great degree, and, and they don't want divergence generally from the European regulation. They talk about individual regulation they don't like. The principle uh, is clearly in their interest because then they can trade more, more, more widely. Uh, so uh, if, if there's divergence, it, it's certainly not going to be for its own sake. Uh, and I think a lot of this will almost look after itself, since if the farmers are saying, we don't want separate regulations, governments are saying we don't want separate regulations, that, then where, are, where is regulatory divergence going, going to come from? Uh, this, would, this would suggest that there's a willingness to have some kind of harmonization. That's a question of what mechanisms we have to make sure that that really happens, and, and things that don't, don't fall out of the picture because nobody thought of them, and you end up creating anomalies that nobody really intended in, in, in the first place. Do you believe I think my final comment really would be that um, we're talking, I think, to some extent about frameworks as though we're almost anticipating Brexit in quite a hard form, as though this is going to take place in a vacuum between the UK and the devolved. I mean, if you look at things like the trade bill that anticipate the immediate re-engagement of the UK into third party agreements, for example, um, and if you consider Michael's last comment, I think we also need to envisage a scenario where there will be a continued convergence of policy um, in a lot of these areas post-Brexit, and, and on that basis that the, the, even the scope for divergence within the UK will then be strictly circumscribed by the fact that I think in many ways the UK could still be tied very closely, even informally, to European standards. So I don't think we should take our eye off the, the, the idea that um, continued e European convergence, including the UK, may, may well still be a scenario after Brexit. Yeah, in fact, the, 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 the argument that we would go for regulatory divergence in a radical way was part of the Brexit argument. It seems to have disappeared, largely. Uh, the, the idea that we could just deregulate because of a realisation that regulations have broad support and also whatever deals we make with the EU or other countries will have that element of regulatory convergence embedded in them. Gosh, quick question. How um, long um, do you envisage this time frame um, to be developing the common frameworks and um, agreeing on them? I mean, do you, ever, do you see a situation where these common frameworks just will not be um, agreed upon? I mean, the, the bill anticipates quite a, a lengthy period. I mean, something else we need to factor in is that there's going to be a transition period now, almost certainly, from, from Brexit till the end of, uh, you know, 21 um, or 20. Um, so that in itself will give a lot of breathing space. Um, but the withdrawal bill seems to be anticipating even a, a longer period. I mean, let's not forget that the powers are sunsetted, so things will have to be done within a certain period of time. But um, I, I would imagine that it's, it's going to be a four to five year period. Okay. Yeah, and the, the other factor is that frameworks would have to be updated continually because of changing conditions, uh, changing technology, changing risks, foreign trade agreements. So uh, some mechanism would have to be make, put in to make sure that they stay up to date. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I thank both our witnesses for coming to give evidence today. And we'll now suspend and go into private session. <laughs>